Well, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation, both Drs. Uh, Hedrick and Drs. Francis. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I have no relevant disclosures uh, to this talk. I think we all know that uh, diverticulitis is a common condition and one that isn't going away anytime soon. In fact, the incidence of this disease is only increasing over the years. Now, among all the patients who present with acute diverticulitis, approximately 10 to 15% will present with complicated disease, defined as the presence of an abscess, fistula, stricture, or a free perforation. Diverticular abscess comprises the majority of these patients with complicated disease, and what was once uniformly managed with surgery, the management of a diverticular abscess today is mainly non-operative. This is data from Toronto, Ontario, and you can see that over a 10-year study period, the proportion of urgent surgeries performed for complicated diverticulitis significantly decreased. And so if we're not just taking these patients directly to the operating room, what is the best management in 2022 of a diverticular abscess? I think most would agree that antibiotics are a necessary first step. And for smaller abscesses, those invariably uh, defined as less than two or three centimeters in size, they're probably sufficient. Even oral outpatient antibiotic management has shown fairly high success rates with these smaller abscesses. For larger abscesses, of course, percutaneous drainage becomes an appealing option. Though comparative data from both the US and Europe with fairly high abscess sizes even in the antibiotics alone group show similar treatment failure rates. Now, of course, the issue with all this comparative data is confounding. And outside of a randomized controlled trial, one can always argue that those who underwent drainage were somehow sicker or needed it more regardless of what table one shows. This recent multicenter study out of the Netherlands doesn't quite solve that issue, but it is amongst the largest series to date on diverticular abscess. They included 447 patients across 10 hospitals, three quarters of whom underwent antibiotic treatment alone and one quarter of whom underwent drainage. And what they showed is that the treatment failure rate was actually higher in the drainage group. Not surprisingly, so was abscess size. But impressively, only 5% of patients in the antibiotics alone group ultimately underwent a drainage procedure for failure to improve. So biased or not, I think at least we are able to decipher a little bit those patients who need a drainage versus those who don't. And I think their regression analysis really summarizes their principal findings, which is that abscess size rather than uh, drainage or not is what really impacts short-term outcomes. What do SAGES and ASCRS say on the matter? In our 2019 consensus statement, SAGES stated that for smaller abscesses less than four centimeters, antibiotics alone are likely to work, and we should consider drainage for those larger abscesses or those patients who don't respond well to antibiotics alone or are clinically uh, unwell, while ASCRS recommended drainage of abscesses greater than three centimeters. I think I would agree that if it's less than three centimeters, you should probably stay away. Um, it'll go away with antibiotics alone, and drainage is not without its own risks. If it's larger than three centimeters and it's accessible, you can certainly go ahead and drain it, but I think a step-up approach with antibiotics alone is a reasonable option as well, especially for those patients who are clinically well. I think in general, the data shows that larger abscesses have short, uh, worse short-term outcomes and are also more likely to get drained, and in no way, shape, or form does that mean that drainage is associated with worse outcomes. And I think this epitomizes the issue with the data that we have. But until higher quality data is available, we have to try to make sense of it all. And finally, what do you do uh, when treatment fails? Meta-analyses show that about one in five patients will fail non-operative management of a diverticular abscess and ultimately come to an operation. I think historically, operating for Hinchy 1 or 2 diverticulitis was associated with considerable 30-day morbidity and mortality. But more modern series have shown that if you can cool it down with either drainage or antibiotics, you can get away with pretty low morbidity rates and low stoma rates when operating. Much like laparoscopic lavage, laparoscopic abscess drainage without resection is an option. There's limited data, but it can be considered. And finally, for those patients who you really don't want to take to the operating room urgently, some have shown success with prolonged bowel arrest, TPN, and long-term antibiotics to really settle down that inflammation, especially when used as a bridge to semi-elective colectomy. So what about elective colectomy after successful management of a diverticular abscess? I think this is probably the more contentious part of the talk. All in all, despite remaining the second leading cause of colectomy in North America, we have certainly seen a decreasing rate of elective surgery for this disease. And among all the historical subgroups of patients who were recommended surgery, the younger patients below age 50, the recurrent diverticulitis patients, 
It's really the complicated disease patients we've seen the steepest decline in elective resection. In fact, in their 2020 uh, practice parameters, ASCRS stated that elective resection should be considered, which represented quite a stark change from 2014 when it was advised. So what gives? Where does this change come from? Well, I think much like with uncomplicated diverticulitis, the decision to proceed with an elective resection in the asymptomatic patient has become an individualized decision and really draws on the multiple factors that all contribute towards the makeup of an individual's quality of life. Yes, it's true that the recurrence rate is higher after complicated rather than uncomplicated diverticulitis, approaching 30% in a recent meta-analysis. And yes, the risk of a complicated recurrence is also higher. But let's look at the flip side of things. The majority of patients will still not recur. And we've learned over the years that diverticulitis is not a progressive disease. And so even if the risk of a complicated recurrence is higher, the overwhelming majority of patients will still have an uncomplicated recurrence. And so if we operate on all patients purely because of the threat of a recurrence or a complicated recurrence, we'd probably be doing a lot of colectomies unnecessarily. And operative morbidity is not a small consideration, especially when dealing with less than ideal operative candidates. In the, in the direct trial referenced by Dr. Hawkins, the leak rate was 15%. And data from Cleveland Clinic has shown that the operative morbidity is even higher when doing an interval colectomy after complicated rather than uncomplicated diverticulitis. More stomas, more synchronous resections, more blood loss, and double the conversion rate. And so in 2019, Sages stated that after a single episode of diverticular abscess, elective surgery should not be offered solely to reduce recurrence. What about some of these other motivating factors, such as fears of emergency surgery or stomas during follow-up? This one is often used as a motivator for elective surgery. We published our institutional experience in 2016 of 73 patients who underwent long-term non-operative management, and only 3% underwent an emergency resection with the stoma during long-term follow-up. In an almost identical issue in DCNR, there was a, a similar paper that painted a bit of a different picture, 26% rate of emergency surgery during follow-up. Well, I think these are tough questions to answer with small single institution series, and these are good questions to answer with big data. In a New York database of over 13,000 patients, 5,000 of whom underwent non-operative management and 1,600 of whom underwent an elective resection, you can see that only 8% of patients in the non-operative group ultimately had an emergency surgery during follow-up. And more so, the elective surgery group had double the stoma rate. Another interesting observational study compared Swiss patients to Scottish patients with vastly different healthcare systems. And after a single episode of diverticular abscess, after five years of follow-up, despite five times more elective surgery in the Swiss population, there was no difference in inpatient death or emergency surgery for diverticulitis. What about the risk of malignancy? Yes, it's true that the risk of an underlying colon cancer is certainly higher with complicated rather than uncomplicated disease, more than tenfold but you're usually able to decipher whether an underlying cancer is there on follow-up endoscopy. And the pure risk of having colon cancer is rarely an indication to operate in these patients. And finally, the immunosuppressed population, they remain bad actors in diverticulitis, and there's pretty limited data looking at non-operative management in complicated disease. One series out of Barcelona showed that among those with a complicated initial presentation, one third had a complicated recurrence, which is far higher than the numbers we discussed earlier. And so I think you do need to have a lower threshold for elective colectomy in this population, balancing the higher risk for surgical morbidity with the higher consequences should they have a complicated recurrence. So in summary for this part, I, I think the data do not support routine colectomy after a first episode of diverticular abscess successfully managed non-operatively. Yes, patients should be counseled regarding the higher risk of recurrence and complicated recurrence, but at the end of the day, much like with uncomplicated disease, this is an individualized decision that should draw on all the factors that go into a patient's quality of life rather than a decision based on fear for any one element. So thank you very much for the time.